Welcome to the broadcast, my dears, and welcome to the fruit basket. Wasn't it wonderful to see the king looking so handsome on the new banknotes that have been printed? He was presented with the first banknotes featuring His Majesty's image during an audience with Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, and these notes will go into circulation on the 5th of June. And this is the first time that the Bank of England has changed the image of a monarch on a banknote. That is a Bank of England banknote because Queen Elizabeth was the first to do so back in 1960, the very first. So I thought it was a rather flattering image there of the king. Hubba hubba, my dear, hubba hubba. Woo! Pass me the smelling salts. Very nice indeed. So we should be pleased with that, shouldn't we? Canada was actually the first to feature Her Majesty back in 1935 when she was an eight-year-old princess and no one really knew her destiny at that point in time when she was eight years old and the king received a leather-bound booklet containing the historic legal tender and on the subject of kings and queens I would love my Spanish fruits who presumably are juicy oranges Uh, the orange juice in Spain is second to none really apart from some parts of America actually and uh, the parts that grow oranges in America also do delicious orange juice, but you've never really had an OJ until you've been to Spain and had them fresh from their groves or orchards, dare I mention the word, orchard, not an American Riviera one, but oh, that beautiful fresh orange juice, if only I could have one of those every morning, delicious. I'm digressing, but my dear fruity Spaniards, our thoughts are with you and your queen, or I should say your former queen, your version of the Queen Mother of Spain, Queen Sophia, because she was rushed off to hospital this week. Apparently she's doing very well now, but at 83 years old, King Philippe is keeping a watchful eye over her. She was rushed to hospital on Wednesday it was, with a urinary tract infection. But we are told by King Philippe that she is very well, she's cheerful and eager to be discharged and return as soon as possible. And as many of you might know, Queen Sophia is, of course, related to the royal family and to our king via Victoria. Her mother, Queen Federica, was descended from Queen Victoria, so therefore she is too. This was actually Queen Sophia's first visit to hospital since 1968, when she last gave birth. Yes, all that time, so she's had a good innings. And she's played out this role as Queen Mother of Spain, if you will, since her husband, King Juan Carlos, abdicated in favour of King Philippe ten years ago. <laughs> and as for the subject of the Harkles and their new ventures on Netflix, <laughs> what a joke, what a joke. But my viewer, one of you, Lana S. Boyd, actually glimpsed into the future a fortnight ago with a comment she made and with a prediction because Lana S. Boyd said, I love Queen Camilla, she's doing a marvellous job and fast becoming one of the nation's favourite royals. She is, my dear, I agree with you very much. And then you went on to say, as for Markle's pet food, Harry better watch his polo ponies or they will become Meghan's mince. (laughs) With added ginger gonads. (laughs) Oh dear, my darling. What a thought and a prospect. I don't want to encounter that sort of imagery in my mind, my dear, but indeed, you were right on the money. You were right on the money. From pet food to polo ponies to mince meat, because we hear that their new machinations include a lifestyle series for the Duchess of Sussex, which is going to include cooking, and she's going to try and pass herself off as a Nigella or a Martha Stewart, and it's Harry that doesn't know whether he's Martha or Arthur isn't it? In fact, it's a certain role reversal there, a gender reversal, if you will, because we all know who wears the trousers in that relationship, metaphorically speaking, and possibly a strap on while she's at it. Megan will conduct the lifestyle series, worthy of QVC or some such infomercial, because it'll be infomercialing and merchandising and sales girling. And uh, the husband, the Duke, is, has got a fine new series, a wonderful series on the art of polo, polo playing, because he fancies himself as some sort of equestrian extraordinaire. <laughs> oh, oh, me, oh my. This is all for Netflix under Archwell Productions that production company of fame and of grand note 
and reputation for being dropped. <laughs> dropped like the balls of an adolescent. Most unseemly. Both of these projects are in early production, we're told, on the website because if you missed it, this news was trumpeted. It was announced by the, the Royal Bugler of Montecito together with curlicued handwriting and a big trombone <laughs> instead of a bugle. It was announced from the office of Prince Harry and Meghan of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. A yada ya, a yada ya, a plurum rex. Both projects are in early production, and we've seen that before, haven't we, lovies? We've seen it before, we all know what that means. It's going nowhere, because these things rarely make it past that post. All of their goings-on rarely make it past that point, do they? Of early production, we'll see what they come up with. Hers, maybe. His, mm, we'll see, we'll see. But the lifestyle series that we're going to get, this study in marketing and sales, will celebrate the joys of cooking, gardening, entertaining and friendship. Oh, doesn't it sound cosy? Doesn't it sound a riot? And doesn't it sound like she's an expert on all of these things? She can cook the best roast chicken in town. She can rustle up the best frog's legs in town. I know that for sure. Gardening, well, they managed to fashion one of their bunion or banyan trees, or whatever it was, my dear, or some palm tree, into a big twosome for them, didn't they? To represent their friendship, so she's got those skills. Entertaining, well, she knows how to light a candle that smells of Soho House and Gwyneth Paltrow's vagina. She's got all those kind of skills, my dear, and she can put them to the test. But then friendship, friendship, ho, ho, ho. Let's ask Jessica Mulrooney, let's ask, What's that gal's name? Pretty, Nikki, Nikki, pretty. That one. And uh, all the rest of the uh, besties that she's ghosted throughout the years. But we all know that friendship for the Duchess these days revolves around the world of celebrity. If you want to be in my gang with the cool cats, uh, then you have to be an Ellen DeGenerate or an Oprah Winefrey or... A Tyler Perry. And what do they all have in common? Ching, ching. Dollar signs in the eyes, my dear. That's what you've got to have. And Jeff Bezos, he wouldn't go astray either. He wouldn't go astray. Harry's adventure in polo was primarily shot at the US Open Polo Championships in Wellington, Florida. Or Florida as Blanche from the Golden Girls would say. It will provide viewers unprecedented access to the world of professional polo, known primarily for its aesthetic and social scene. The series will pull the curtain back on the grit and passion of the sport, capturing players and all it takes to compete at the highest level. Well, I can tell you, my dears, that those that are at the highest level of polo playing society won't be pleased to know that there is going to be some sort of behind the curtain peek at that world. It's a private world. It's a world built on trust, not duplicitousness and not vulgarity. And uh, I'm afraid those who are truly in the know and not some vulgar, brash addition to the polo scene are not going to be impressed and are not going to take this kindly. The ones that do, well, there you are, my dear. You know who you're dealing with. The Prince Harry's and the cheesy Nachos Figueres, whatever it is, my dear. The ones that welcome this news of a peek behind the curtain are quite simply de classe, my dear, de classe. Because the only way they're going to make the world of polo interesting for the masses is to pull a Jilly Cooper. Perhaps Harry fancies himself as one of Jilly Cooper's heroes from polo or the man who made husbands jealous. <laughs> I don't think so, Harry. You're pitching in a bit high here with your rivals and riders' fantasy. With this fantasy. But if they are intending on capturing viewers for it that return for episodes two, three, and four, on going instead of just a one-off piece, then they are going to have to put drama and glitz and glamour into it and all of those things. And I'm afraid that they're going to make the world of polo appear as if it's some sort of made in Chelsea reality show or at home with the Kardashians. Uh, 
whatever it's going to be, I'm quite sure that it's going to be vulgar. We've also been treated to Prince Harry appearing in his role as Chief Impact Officer. Oh, yes, I am the Chief. How, 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 the Chief Impact Officer of Better Up or Butter Up or whatever it's called in San Francisco. And he was joined by Cisco's Chief People Officer. How, how, I be the Chief Impact Officer. I be the Chief People Officer. Welcome, welcome to my wigwam. How now, brown cow? What a joke. What word salad is this? These word salad job titles. Where are people coming up with this primary school confection? I'm the chief this and I'm the chief that. Do you remember you used to play, you used to play school with your friends when you were young and you'd take it into, I want to call the register. I'm going to play the teacher and I'm going to call the register. I'm going to do, and I'm this, that and the fourth. This is what they're doing between each other. I'm the chief people officer. I'm the chief impact officer. I'm the most important. You are the chief nitwit, Harry. That is exactly what you are. The chief nitwit and nincompoop. He was also joined by a psychologist on the theme of courageous leadership. Remember, he's a dragon slayer. I'm going to slay all those dragons because I am so full of courage. In fact, St George wasn't even English. So I think that the kingdom needs a new patron saint when I return to my rightful place on the throne and become King Henry the Ninth. I think it needs a new patron saint. Henry Wales. Oh, yes. Henry Sussex. Henry the King of Montecito. I'm going to be the new patron saint uh, because I show courageous leadership. Uh, I will say, I will say that I thought he looked great. I'm going to have a moment of kindness. I thought the wardrobe was the fantastic thing about it. I think it might be the best he has ever done. The best he has ever done pulling that out of the wardrobe. It looked natural, but put together, not too scruffy. No, not too much hippie bead affair that I saw at first glance anyway. And he looked fresh and full of zest and zeal and happy and uh, very relaxed. I'm going to give it to him. He did. He looked great, my dear. You know, as good as Harry gets. Don't get, don't get it twisted. He looked as good as he can get. But this was b the Beyond Burnout panel discussion or whatever it was. Turning stress into strength. This was the theme of it. Turning stress into strength. Oh, I wonder if he passed on this material to the late Queen when she was dying. Or his late grandfather, the Duke. I wonder if he passed on the material to them. You're under great stress. Yes, by you, Harry boy. You're under great stress because Willie, Willie, Granny, it's Willie, he does this to you. I know that I'm your bestie and you can only confide in me. And you love me and Megsy Viper more than anybody else. More than Waity and Willie. <laughs> Waity and Willie. Willie Waity. You prefer us to them, don't you, Gran? And they put you under so much stress with their racism. <laughs> it's terrible. No, Harry, that was you. Um, <laughs> he should have sent her some instructions, but guess what? She already knew how to turn stress into strength because she did it magisterially with great queenhood and with great humanity and naturally because she was truly royal in spirit not just in name. Now, I'm going to turn back to the subject of J.K. Rowling, which I addressed in a previous video. I'm not going to linger on it for as long as I did the other day. I devoted a whole video to it, and thank you so much for your reaction and your words to it. It's not often that I go off subject, but when I do, it's very nice to be warmly received. Thank you for that. But a couple of days after I published that broadcast, which was heavily critical of Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson, especially Daniel Radcliffe and the vulgar way that he apologised on J.K. Rowling's behalf just through association, not even for his own views. Since then, in fact two days after, J.K. Rowling made it clear that it is not safe to assume that she would forgive them if they offered a public apology. So I was a little bit ahead of the curve there. She said that celebrities who cozied up to a movement that's intent on eroding women's hard-won rights 
and who used their platforms to cheer on the transitioning of minors can save their apologies for traumatised detransitioners and vulnerable women reliant on single sex spaces. And for those of you abroad, you might not know that it's been a big week here in the kingdom, a big news week in the wake of a review by Dr. Hilary Cass, I think it was several years in the making, four years, a very robust report commissioned by the NHS, our National Health Service. Yes, commissioned by NHS England and NHS Improvement to make recommendations. The Cass review is an independent review of gender identity services to children and young people, and it has delivered stinging criticisms earth-shattering criticisms of NHS gender clinics this week. Clinics for adults and children with a damning description of the Gender Identity Development Service. And the fears and suspicions that many of us had have come to light in this independent review commissioned by the NHS. And a lot of people are seeing the light, a lot of people are feeling rather ashamed that they have been deluded and tugged into some sort of fantasy over the past few years and a lot of people are understanding that just despite the fact that nobody is denying that transition or few people I should say because there are some who are totally against transition I am not one of those people I think the majority of people agree that there that transitioning is the right approach for some people for some who are old enough to make the decision, informed enough and sane enough to make the decision. But there is a generation of vulnerable people out there who are now becoming mutilated detransitioners, living a life of deep regret with their whole life stretched out ahead of them, who have been put on puberty blockers, who have been put on irrevocable medications with <laughs> irrevocable consequences, I should say, or have taken the drastic step of having surgery that they later go on to regret, are no longer able to bear children, produce eggs or sperm, all these kind of things, my dear, because it's been multiplying in its thousands. And children at the most tender of ages have been given all these rights and privileges to call themselves whatever they want, and teachers are going along with it. And, you know, every thought and feeling and emotion that these children have just affirmed, the emphasis on affirming it all the time, and many of these children, it has to be said, are autistic. Many of them are from vulnerable backgrounds. Some have suffered abuse. And I don't want to generalize or fear monger or give that information to you in a hysterical way. It doesn't apply to all of them. There are perfectly rational, sane, sober decision making children amongst that number, including those from vulnerable backgrounds and those who are autistic. Nevertheless, there are particularly damning consequences for some of these demographics. And finally, it is being brought to light. Gary Wellgars left a comment saying that one suspects that Radcliffe and Watson are anxiously awaiting instructions from their publicists as to what exactly their new positions on this topic will be. Well, my suspicion and my hunch is that both of them are too arrogant and too set on their woke path to even consider the idea of apologising. I'm not sure that it would even dawn upon either of them at this point in time. You never know. You say celebrity clowns are indispensable to the woke circus. And I should also say that in the previous broadcast, I let Rupert Grint off the hook. It hadn't actually occurred to me that he had also said, I firmly stand with the trans community and echo the sentiments expressed by many of my peers. Trans women are women. This is Rupert Grint, who played the Ron Weasley character. Trans women are women. Trans men are men. So the sky is green and the grass is blue. The sky is green and the grass is blue. We should all be entitled to live with love and without judgment. Well, so should J.K. Rowling, my dear. So should J.K. Rowling. So I'm afraid all three of them don't pass my test for juicy fruits. But actually, all this chatter put me in mind of a video that I saw almost a year ago, I think, because a viewer of mine by the name of Marla Martinson, who seems like a lovely lady, 
and has her own channel that I'd like to direct you to. I remember watching a video that she conducted uh, because she very kindly sent me a tip jar treat for a cup of coffee on a couple of occasions, I think. And she sent a message and I looked at her channel and she was interviewing Buck Angel. Have any of you seen Buck Angel? Because Buck Angel now has a, a channel. Buck Angel uh, is a great guy, I have to say. A female to male transitioner who accepts exactly what he is. And uh, there is a wonderful video that I will link to in the description box. It was called, uh, what was it called? Transgender versus Transsexual with Buck Angel. This is going back a while, but as I say, now Buck has his own channel, which is thriving. It's actually thriving. So check out both Marla and Buck's channel. But Marla is a viewer of ours, so it'd be uh, interesting for you to see what she's got to say on lots of other topics as well. She's a very good interviewer. I've got to say I really enjoyed the interview that she did with Buck. Just common sense, the vast majority of us would go along with, I think, my dear, I don't want to speak on your behalf. But you know, Buck is a biological female who lives as a man. And just as I, and I would fancy most of you, would accept Buck living as a dude, as Buck says, as a dude, he also accepts that he is not an actual man and came to terms with that a long time ago. And it's very distressing for him and other trans men and many trans women to see this pickle that the world have got themselves in and to see the lies that the young ones coming through are being told and brainwashed into. And uh, we see the madness. We see the madness, my dear. Ladies, brace yourself. Peter Phillips is single. Yes, he is. Lucky Lindsay, as I've always called the girl, Lucky Lindsay Wallace has had her time. Luck has petered out. <laughs> And uh, the talk is that they've gone their separate ways. Lindsay, the daughter of an oil tycoon, an old school chum of Zara, has had a good old innings with Peter and lots of fun. But now it's open season, ladies. It's open season. So it's time to go a hunting and go after Peter Phillips, who is built like a comfy armchair, as we know, my dear. And it's time for a new derriere to sink into its velvety confines and onto the royal lap and have a bounce. Well, I should say semi-royal, isn't he? Semi-royal, you know, he's not titled, but comes from royal stock. And it is a shame, isn't it? That Autumn Kelly, the wife, the ex-wife, uh, she was a lovely looking thing, wasn't she? The Canadian gal, lovely looking gal, looked the part, romantic name, from Grace to Autumn. Grace Kelly to Autumn Kelly. From Grace to Autumn. Oh, I like that. Autumn Kelly, uh, the mother of his children. She looked to the part, but divorce runs in the family, doesn't it, my dear? There you go. D-I-V-O-R-C-E becomes final today. Uh, and also, Peter, based at Gatcombe as he is, and with Lucky Lindsay, based in Scotland, it was always going to be a little bit tricky. But there you are. Any debutantes out there on the scene? Go for it, girls. And what a fabulous mother-in-law you would have in the shape of the Princess Royal. And Anne has been on royal duty, visiting the Royal Navy's newest frigate, HMS Ventura, which is currently under construction in Rosyth. As royal sponsor of the ship, Her Royal Highness toured the assembly facility and met some of the ship's company at work. They've been constructing the UK's first Type 31 warship with new life breathed into the 455-foot vessel, turning her into a working warship that's ready to serve around the globe. And she has also been in Northern Ireland for a surprise appearance in this jaunty, bright neck scarf, and the crowds greeted her in raptures before her arrival at the Southwest College's Urn campus. And this was a special visit to recognise the college's commitment to education, sustainability and community. And the principal said that welcoming Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, to the Urn campus has been a pleasure for me and the team. The Princess Royal demonstrated a very keen interest in the work of our students and staff across all curriculum areas and was impressed by our sustainability credentials. 
The Prince of Wales and Prince George were spotted enjoying themselves at a football match for Aston Villa and they were seen together here for the first time since Catherine's predicament was shared with the world. It was also claimed in the Richard Eden column at the Daily Mail that William was seen in a pub in North Norfolk together with Carol, with mummy-in-law, and that Carol has been staying with the Waleses over the Easter. But yes, it seems they've been enjoying a pint together at the local pub. Low key, no fanfare. And no doubt those Yorkie girls have been schmoozing and boozing as well. They attended the Ellie Goulding with served private party at the Royal Albert Hall and Edo was on the arm as well. Rumour has it that usually introduced Ellie to her estranged husband, Caspar Jopling. But those times are over now. Usually here gets it right. I very much approve of this Gabriella Hurst armour knit on her in heather grey cashmere silk. Nice, but I wasn't keen on the accessories and I think the bag's ugly and I think that it would have been improved with a silver clutch in the arm, something a little bit shiny perhaps to offset the muted grey cashmere. But nevertheless, a lovely cut, but it is Gabriella Hurst. We love a bit of old Gabby Hurst, don't we, my dears? I didn't enjoy Beatrice's Zara ensemble of jacket and emerald pleated skirt. But it was perfectly acceptable, uh, just a little dowdy, like a dowdy sixth former it put me in mind of. But she made up for that later, which we'll look at in a moment. But on the subject of Eugenie, she also attended a reception the same day with a panel discussion on the fashion industry's commitment to sustainability. And it was co-hosted by the US ambassador to the UK, Jane Hartley. And they're pictured here together. Uh, she's with Princess Eugenie and also with Gabriella Hurst. And she was also spied wandering the streets of London in the same ugly bag and this Reese Lavinia double-breasted jacket. And then here's Princess Beatrice back on form for date night. Lovely colours here, isn't it? Lovely colours. Aubergine is this maxi coat by Hobbs and a satin bias cut skirt by Whistles with burgundy velvet Jimmy Choo's. Gorgeous, gorgeous. This was an Arlington restaurant in Mayfair letting their hair down, having a gay old time. Hurrah! And coming up my rear is the dashing Duke of Edinburgh who attended the commissioning ceremony of a new naval ship which will help to safeguard UK waters from underwater threats. The Royal Fleet Auxiliary's Stirling Castle was formally dedicated during a high profile ceremony in Leith, Scotland and the new ship was welcomed into the RFA's family in the presence of Edward Edinburgh, who is the service's Commodore in Chief. And moving away from traditional mine hunting, the ship embraces cutting edge technology to act as a mother ship for an array of remotely operated and autonomous systems which will scour waters looking for mines. And doesn't the Duke look handsome? That's all I've got for you today, my dear Fruit Crumbles. Thank you very much for joining me. Leave me a lovely comment. Let me know what you've been up to. And if you'd like to treat me, send me something naughty or nice, then my tip jar is in the description box. And I thank you for your company. See you next time, my dears. Ta-ra and toodle pip.